If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. We will continue on to express in no uncertain terms the danger that this country, indeed this world, finds itself in in the uh, evangelical romance with Rome that is occurring in our day. But before I get into all of that, I want you to uh, turn to a, a passage of Scripture that is a, a bit obscure, perhaps a passage you've not read lately. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 28. If you turn to Jeremiah chapter 28, I want to read this short chapter of Scripture with you, and then I think you'll see after reading it how it fits in with uh, my assignment for this hour. Jeremiah chapter 8. Now it came about in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I'm going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I am also going to bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord confirm your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. Yet, hear now this word which I am about to speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and of calamity and of pestilence. The prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then that prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord. Even so I will break within two full years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations. Then the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Now then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and speak to Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord. You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made instead of them yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have also given him the beasts of the field. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen now. Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, and you have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm about to remove you from the face of the earth. This year you are going to die, because you have counseled rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year, in the seventh month. 
most of you and the rest of the Christian world know that something dramatic happened in Augsburg, Germany on October 31st, 1517. We're reminded last night of this event on that day an obscure monk named Martin Luther ambled up to the north door of the castle church in Wittenberg and nailed 95 theses to the door. Now Luther had written his theses in protest to the Roman Catholic practice of selling indulgences to the populace. At the time, Luther was not so much concerned with Rome's right to mercifully release a penitent sinner from a penance imposed by a priest. Neither was Luther concerned with the Romish practice of reducing time in purgatory through the granting of an indulgence. Luther had not come to the point in his theological education at this particular moment in time where he was chiefly concerned even with the doctrine of purgatory. Luther despised the selling of indulgences. He challenged Roman hierarchy on that basis. He did not believe that the Pope at Rome could close the gates of hell and open the door to paradise through the sale of indulgences. This is what inflamed Luther's mind and his heart. Well, we know that this spark of protest ignited what has since become known as the Great Protestant Reformation. And from this humble beginning, the entire world was soon turned on its head. But a closer look at the issue bears out why Luther's protest of the sale of indulgences had such a dramatic effect. And we need to understand the sale of indulgences was only the spark of a much deeper and more complex theological question that gnawed away at Martin Luther. The sheer idea of indulgences brings to center stage the idea of forgiveness. In reality, indulgences are the end result of a rather complex theological labyrinth all centered around the word forgiveness. Forgiveness, in turn, is related to the question of punishment and hell and heaven. And overall, these things are related to the mission of Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation. Now, in Roman Catholic theology, indulgences are dispensed as a way of reducing the amount of suffering one should undergo for personal sins. This signifies that in Rome there is yet a price to be paid for personal sins. Indulgences are granted either for the partial or the plenary, that is, full remission of temporal punishments due personal sins. Temporal punishments are alleged to be set by God in a place called purgatory. No one is sure how long one must endure purgatory. However, Rome is convinced that time spent in purgatory can be lessened through the granting of indulgences. Well, it's no wonder that the questioning of indulgences and the sale of indulgences by Martin Luther led to a deeper inquiry of how a man is forgiven. And this, in turn, led to a question of how a man is justified before God. Ultimately, knew if one... Rome knew if one were to follow the logic that Luther's little protest against the misuse of indulgences would lead to a wholesale investigation of how Rome views forgiveness. And in light of this, Luther had to go. Luther had to go. Rome knew that this was the tip of the iceberg. That if you do the logic, one thing follows another and eventually you're into this entire question of God's forgiveness and man's entry into the gates of heaven. Well, most of you know the rest of the story. The great Protestant Reformation. 
in the ensuing theological chaos on the European continent, spreading across to the British Isles and ultimately the United States and so forth, and the whole world was affected. But what many Christians may not know, and this is what we need to focus on this morning, is that on October 31st, 1999, October 31st, 1999, 482 years after Luther lodged his protest, another equally dramatic event took place on the very site, choosing the very same day and location of Luther's challenge, representatives of the Roman Catholic religion and the Lutheran World Federation signed an agreement. And this agreement was entitled a Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, which we shall call JDJ, Joint Declaration on Justification, hailed by some enthusiasts as an end to the Roman Catholic Protestant divide. This document has received much attention and much press worldwide, but I'm wondering out loud how many Christians are even aware that this took place and the significance of this event. Now I brought with me a press clipping from ENI News Service, and I just want to read a portion of this to you as far as the press release on this. Augsburg, 1st November. On October 31st, 482 years to the day after Martin Luther nailed on a church door his list of 95 theses protesting against the sale of indulgences, thus setting in train the Lutheran Reformation, Lutherans and Roman Catholics have solemnly declared that mutual condemnations from the Reformation era no longer apply. At 11.20 a.m. yesterday, before a congregation which filled St. Anna's Lutheran Church in Augsburg, Germany, Cardinal Edward Cassidy, Vice President of the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, and Lutheran Bishop Christian Cross of Brunswick, President of the Lutheran World Federation, signed the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. According to the document, there is now a consensus in basic truths between Lutherans and Catholics on the issue of justification one of the most contentious issues which divided Luther and his followers from the papacy. As a result, the mutual doctrinal condemnations do not apply to the teaching of the dialogue partners as presented in the joint declaration. Minutes later, spontaneous applause broke out in the church as several representatives from several countries sign the documents, including representatives from Norway, India, Slovakia, Brazil, and the United States of America. One bishop was quoted as saying, we are witnessing a significant day in the history of our churches for the first time in centuries here in Augsburg, we are again setting foot on common ground. Antagonism and frequently even enmity between our churches have been the source of conflicts, distress, suffering for many people in many countries on earth. May God give us strength for reconciliation and the courage to seek peace. Now I submit to you this morning that this document that was signed, this joint declaration on justification, has been well received throughout the world. And it has been hailed as the end to the antagonism that has existed between at least the Lutheran body of the evangelical world and the Roman Catholic religion. Now what we wish to do this morning is interact with this declaration and analyze it in terms of its theological validity. Does this document represent a substantial change in Roman Catholic theology? Does this document represent any substantial shift in historic Lutheran theology? And does this document mean anything at all? Perhaps it is best to begin by setting forth what this document is not. 
In the first place, JDJ is not representative of the conservative wing of Lutheranism. The Lutheran World Federation is the liberal end of Lutheranism worldwide. In fact, there were not any representatives present in the construction of JDJ from any of the large conservative Lutheran bodies. Most conservative Lutherans have renounced the document and have stood against it from the start. Although I would add this caveat. In a recent article published in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's national magazine, there was a head article on this joint declaration. And the writer, a Lutheran theologian of the conservative slant in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, officially decried the document. And he said, we feel that this document is out of order and we ourselves cannot sign it because we feel it does not represent our understanding of justification at all. However, and this is the danger, the article went on to say that the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, despite our differences with the Roman Catholic Church on the issue of justification, nevertheless recognizes their right as brothers and sisters in Christ to develop a doctrine of justification that differs from ours. So while condemning the document itself as a betrayal of historic Lutheran understanding of justification, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod nevertheless has not rejected the Roman Catholic understanding of justification as a bona fide understanding of a bona fide Christian worshiping community. I think that's very interesting. I think that's very relevant too because that tells me that even though the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod did not get behind this document, they don't have a clue as to the issues either. JDJ, secondly, is not an infallible document by Roman Catholic standards. The Pope has not declared JDJ infallible. JDJ also clearly avoids addressing the numerous issues which stem from Rome's understanding of justification. The cold hard fact of the matter is that if Rome ever embraced the Protestant Reformation model of justification, then it would cease to exist. That's the cold hard fact. If they ever embraced the Protestant, the true Protestant understanding of justification, they would cease to exist. Needless to say, Rome did not disassemble itself after signing this document. They are still there. However, it remains to be seen if the Lutheran World Federation has begun to disassemble itself. And therein lies the storm clouds on the horizon. I believe that the Lutheran World Federation has begun to decompose. Soon it will be part of the Roman Catholic religion, if it's not already. What then is the purpose of JD Day? Why has it come into existence? What do the framers have in mind? Where is all this leading? Well, without impugning too many motives, it seems crystal clear to me that both the Roman Catholic community and the Lutheran World Federation understand that the way in which sinners are justified before God is of paramount importance. They are also aware that a stark difference on justification is primarily what separates Roman Catholicism from Protestantism. The question of justification is truly the hinge upon which the entire door of the Protestant Reformation swings. And it seems transparent enough in reading this document that the intention is to bring Rome and the Lutheran World Federation closer together at a deeper level. Now we should note right at the start that the question as to whether the Roman Catholic religion belongs under the umbrella of Christianity is not on the table here. That is not on the table here. The Lutheran World Federation is not concerned that Romanism is not Christianity. The Lutheran World Federation apparently has little regard for the biblical gospel, which automatically outs Rome. It is only concerned that the two can come closer together. And realizing that justification is set forth in historic Reformation creeds is flat out contradictory to the Roman Catholic teaching, the Lutheran World Federation and Rome have hammered out this joint declaration. And this accord that they have hammered out seems to be an attempt at resolving the historical problem. We do not believe that there is a current theological crisis between modern Rome and liberal Lutheranism. We do not believe that. Modern 
liberal Lutheranism has already accepted the Roman Catholic religion as a bona fide Christian worshiping community. Their issue is to somehow eliminate these pesky historical creeds and documents which they are bound to by carrying around the name Lutheran on their name tags. And they want to get rid of them. And the way to get rid of them is to forge ahead and create a new one. Apparently, it has never dawned upon the Lutheran Federation that Rome's view of justification and the subsequent theological fallout from it precludes Rome from being considered a part of Christianity. It has never dawned on them that Rome's view of justification precludes them from the Christian community. But like the ECT statement in 1994, this declaration assumes that Rome is in, and this tragic presupposition lays bare the theological integrity of liberal Lutheranism and fits in well with a modern lust for an ecumenism void of any gospel truth. And that's the world we live in. There is a lust for ecumenism void of any gospel truth. Now we have pointed out over and over and over again the danger of these kinds of declarations. And as Christians, I don't think we can for a minute lose our focus. The contents of the declaration, of this declaration or any other declaration, needs to be examined, but not at the expense of letting stand the assumption behind the context. And what I mean by that? We'll take this declaration, if this were the declaration itself, we need to examine this and we need to look at it and see whether or not it holds any theological credibility. But by the same token, we have to also understand an examination of the presuppositions going into such a document need to be examined as well. And JDJ is another joint statement which assumes that Roman Catholicism is Christian. It falls in line with all the other recent declarations, the ECT, the gift of salvation, and others, which view Rome's understanding of justification as merely a peculiar view of justification that needs some Protestant tweaking for it to be refined enough to be accepted by other so-called Christian brethren. Before reading one word of JDJ, we need to understand and lament the fact that the Lutheran World Federation has forsaken the gospel for the sake of Rome. That's presupposition. Furthermore, we lament the confusion which will inevitably come from this effort to harmonize the sweet voices of the Protestant Reformation with the cacophony of Romanism. And with this in mind, we need to examine the document. If I could just digress for a minute. When ECT came out, I think spring of 94, there was a great outcry from conservative evangelical Christians. But the presupposition of the framers of ECT has never been repented of. And that presupposition is that Roman Catholicism is, in fact, a bona fide Christian community, worshiping the same God, believing in the same Jesus Christ, and having an alternative view of how one gets to heaven that is nevertheless acceptable to God. That's the presupposition. And with that presupposition, these men are running around writing these kinds of documents. And they're turning them loose as fast as they can get them out onto the world. And the world, of course, embraces them. And later on in the day, we're going to talk about what the evangelical world is doing in embracing these kinds of documents. And in fact, writing these kinds of documents. Now then, let's go right directly to the document itself. The document states its purpose right up front, and I'll quote from the beginning portion of J.D.J. 
and I quote, the present joint declaration has this intention, namely to show that on the basis of their dialogue, the subscribing Lutheran churches and the Roman Catholic Church are now able to articulate a common understanding of our justification by God's grace through faith in Christ. It does not cover all that either church teaches about justification. It does encompass a consensus on basic truths of the doctrine of justification and shows that the remaining differences in its explication are no longer the occasion for doctrinal condemnations. Now, I'm going to unpack that for you step by step. They have said a whopping mouthful there, and we need to unpack it. We need to see what it says. The key words here are as follows. One, common understanding. The second section, key words, are consensus on basic truths. Evidently, to the framers of this document, common understanding and basic truth are regulated to the fact that justification is somehow by God's grace through faith. Now you need to understand this. You'll never understand what's going on in our nation today unless you understand the terminology is being used. And I know it's a bit tedious, but you have to pay attention to this. The document says that they can agree on justification because both parties agree that somehow justification is by God's grace through faith. In the mind of the framers, so strong is this core that the remaining differences in explication of what it means, God's grace through faith, are no longer worthy of consideration. As long as you can say we are saved by God's grace through faith, that's it. How you explain it is your own business. What you take back to your home church is your own business. Essentially, if you can walk, chew gum, and say God's grace through faith, you're in. And Rome can do that. I believe in justification by God's grace through faith, and every explication of what this means is above reproach. Every explication of what this means is above reproach. You can explain it any way you want to, as long as you believe this. That's the way it's going. Well, the problem here is glaring. It will never do to say we are justified by grace through faith. We must understand and set forth clearly how we are justified by grace. We must also define the word grace and give a crystalline picture of faith as it unfolds in the Bible. Furthermore, what is missing from this formula is the word alone. It is not simply that we are justified by God's grace through faith. This is a favorite statement of Rome. The Reformation was fought over the word alone. The formula for the Reformation was sola fide, faith alone. That statement is not made, not surprisingly, in JDJ. If JDJ had been constructed on the foundation of biblical exegesis, it would not have been signed by anyone. Neither side could have signed it. The reason is that Rome does not believe in sola fide, and the Lutheran World Federation apparently cannot grasp either the meaning or the significance of sola fide either. So if this document had been constructed on proper biblical exegesis, neither party would have signed it. But there is more to JDJ which must be considered. Like most documents of this sort, JDJ is filled with ambiguous terminology and phraseology. It seems that the crafters have bent over backwards to keep language elusive. No doubt this was done in a desperate attempt on both sides. And such projects, incidentally, are doomed from the start. Most conservative Roman Catholics now scoff at JDJ because they know exactly what Rome teaches concerning justification. They realize that all the word mongering and word smithing in the world cannot bring radically opposite understandings together as one. So there is enough in this document to feed the Roman concept of initial and ongoing justification based upon condign merit, and there is just enough said about Christ and our righteousness to enable a historic Lutheran to read JDJ in his way. But at the end of the day, 
both parties walk away with their own spin on what this document really means. At the end of the day, Rome walks away and says, well, we've got our document and we know what it means. And the, the poor Lutheran World Federation walks away and says, we've got our document, we know what it means. And the two are using absolutely the same language with absolutely different meanings that are totally contrary to one another and they're calling it a consensus. The real danger, I think, is all too apparent. With both sides walking away with a different twist on what is involved in the justification of the ungodly, what is lost in the shuffle? The gospel itself is lost in the shuffle. To compound this indignity, both parties have the gall to affirm one another's views. It comes as no surprise that spin language is at work here. We are now fed the spin. We are asked to visualize the Lutheran tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition as the two sides of the same coin. We're asked to swallow the language of equivocation and moderation. We hear things like this. The Lutherans retain this, or they view that, or they hold to this, or they hold to that. Likewise, Rome is said to have its tradition or its distinctive understanding of this or that. Rome is said to have an idiosyncratic way of viewing this or that. What this amounts to at the end of the day is absolute sheer obfuscation. It is a total distortion and muddle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this document is rich with it. At different points, JDJ presents justification void of definition. Generalizations abound so as to allow disparate explications to flourish. In this cloud of confusion, it is no wonder that both sides have managed to convince themselves that each one's radically diametrical, historical understanding of justification can be claimed from the document. How odd. How odd. Let me give you an illustration of what J.D.J. says about the justified. I'll read this sentence twice so you can follow it carefully. Quote, the justified live by faith that comes from the word of Christ and is active through love, the fruit of the Spirit. But since the justified are assailed from within and without by powers and desires and fall into sin, they must constantly hear God's promises anew, confess their sins, and participate in Christ's body and blood and be exhorted to live righteously in accord with with the will of God. Let me read that just one more time. The justified live by faith that comes from the word of Christ and is active through love, the fruit of the Spirit. But since the justified are assailed from within and without by powers and desires and fall into sin, they must constantly hear God's promises anew, confess their sins and participate in Christ's body and blood and be exhorted to live righteously in accord with the will of God. I don't have the foggiest idea what that means. Do you? I have no clue what they're saying here. But it sounds magnificent. <laughs> but I am at a loss as to what they're getting at. In this one little paragraph, we have an absolute miniature of all that's wrong with this document. Undefined language used throughout the Declaration. We are not told anywhere in this document what is meant by the justified. To the Christian, this means the one who has been justified. To Rome, it means the ones who have started in the process of justification. In Rome, the process starts at infant baptism. In Christianity, the declaration of justification begins and ends at the point of faith. It is not a process at all. Neither are we told what it means to participate in Christ's body and blood. Notice this little sentence says we have to participate in Christ's body and blood. What does that mean? The Christian understands the Lord's table as a memorial meal to commemorate the finished work of Christ and to proclaim his death until he returns. Rome understands this to mean actually eating the body and blood of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. 
So if you tell somebody that they have to participate in Christ's body and blood, what have you said? Rome says, amen, right, participate, eat it. Get forgiveness of sin. The Christian says, amen, right, participate in the Lord's body and blood. It's a memorial that we celebrate. Radically opposite understandings, but never explained in the document. When we come to the heart of JDJ, wherein justification is explained, we read the following. Together we confess by grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us unto good works. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That's something I can grab onto a little bit here. Together we confess by grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God. That sounds so good, but it's actually pretty bad. Sounds great, but it's actually pretty ugly. It sounds like it's right out of the pages of Scripture, but really, it's right out of the minds of the ecumenists. Notice, by grace alone is not the same as by faith alone. Notice, not because of any merit on our part does not exclude merit produced by the Spirit of God. Notice, receiving the Holy Spirit is not defined. Rome believes that the Holy Spirit is called down in the waters of infant baptism and printed indelibly on the heart in their sacrament of confirmation. Christians do not. So you can say, together we confess by grace alone, but unless you're willing to define what grace alone means, you've said nothing. You can say, in faith in Christ's saving work and not because of any merit on our part, but unless you're willing to exclude meritorious works produced by the Spirit of God, you haven't said anything that pertains to the gospel. You see how tricky the language is? And this is deliberate. It's absolutely deliberate. Had you been at the debate the other night, you would have understood that Bob Genesis does believe in justification by grace. He absolutely does. But his definition of grace and how one gets it and how God uses it and where to find it and what it does inside of a person and all that is radically and utterly opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, you can say all day long, I'm justified by grace alone, and you haven't even come close to the gospel. And that's what this document does. Along with this equivocating language, there are some other twists, I think, which deserve our attention. Within JDJ, there is an authentication of the use of the word sacrament. And I do hope that I bother some people with this this morning, because I can leave. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Lutherans and Roman Catholics disagree as to the exact number and essential meaning of the word sacrament. But sacramentalism is left within this document as though it were a Christian concept and somehow part of the Christian experience. It is not. Sacramentalism is taken to the limit by Rome. Rome teaches that her sacraments are necessary for salvation. Sacramentalism is more low-key in Lutheranism, but appears as a sort of common glue in this document between Rome and the LWF. Christians would balk at sacramentalism of any kind, since the entire idea behind sacramentalism undermines biblical justification. Now just let me put this warning in here for you. I know that there are some well-meaning Protestant denominations that still like to throw about this term sacrament. And it's only because they've never debated a Roman Catholic apologist on the sacramental system. If they had ever had that experience, they'd never used the word again the rest of their life. <laughs> but there's a residue of first wave reformers that likes to use this term sacrament. I would encourage you to omit it from your vocabulary unless you're talking about 
how dangerous it is because Rome is a sacramental religion. They believe the only way to heaven is through their sacramental system. And of course, it's not a biblical term. Nobody can define it anyway. I challenged my opponent on this point when I debated Jeremiatics on the issue of sacraments. I said, would you just define this word for me? Give me a good, healthy, solid definition of the word sacrament. He couldn't do it. And I said, you can't define it, and it's not in Scripture. What do you want me to do with it? And you've built your entire religion around it. Well, this word sacrament is laced throughout this document, and I'll have more to say on that later on. Also inherent within JDJ, with full approval, is the Roman Catholic Lutheran doctrine of baptismal regeneration. I'm going to read very carefully here as the Lutherans commit theological suicide. Listen to this. We confess together that sinners are justified by faith in the saving action of God in Christ, by the action of the Holy Spirit in baptism. They are granted the gift of salvation which lays the basis for the whole Christian life. They just gave away the store. It's over. Turn the lights out. The party is over. <laughs> they have just said that salvation is granted by God in the waters of baptism. That's what they have said. The document goes on to say, and I quote, Despite sin, the Christian is no longer separated from God because in the daily return to baptism, the person who has been born anew by baptism and the Holy Spirit has his sin forgiven. That's baptismal regeneration. Rome believes in that. I never really thought Lutherans did. When you talk to them, it doesn't seem like they do. It seems like they do the tap dance, song and dance routine around the issue of baptism. But these folks do. It goes on to say, justification is the forgiveness of sins, liberation from the dominating power of sin and death and from the curse of the law. It is acceptance into communion with God already now, but then fully in God's coming kingdom. That's right, that's good. But now we hear this. It unites with Christ and with his death and resurrection. It occurs in the reception of the Holy Spirit in baptism and incorporation into the one body. If you were to line me up against the wall and say, Zins, I'm going to shoot you right in the head unless you are totally honest with me, and I know because I've got you hooked up to my machine that tells me if you're totally honest. <laughs> I know if you're going to lie to me or not. And I want you to tell me the one issue that has done more to confound the gospel of Jesus Christ and to obliterate it and to destroy it and to confuse it. What one issue would you say? My answer would be quick and short. Baptism. Baptism. More blood has been shed over baptism than any other issue in the history of the church. Baptism. We have Roman Catholic Baptismal regeneration at the front end with their practice of pedo baptism and then you have the entire Church of Christ, a large denomination in the southern tier of the United States with their baptismal regeneration at the other end. Baptism doth now save you. You cannot be saved unless you are baptized. And between these two heretics hangs the Lord of glory. But baptism is a huge issue. I don't know why... People don't talk about baptism more. It's a huge issue. I bought with me a book because I wanted to know. This is the Creeds of Christendom. Philip Schaff, most of you are familiar with this. And in it, Philip Schaff has done us a great service by compiling the early creeds. And this is startling. It hurts to read it. This is the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession was written in 1530 not too far removed from the initial stages of the great Protestant Reformation. And this is a confession of the Lutheran churches. 
those who had gotten behind Luther. When it comes to baptism, this is what it says. Of baptism, the churches teach that it is necessary to salvation and that by baptism the grace of God is offered and that children are to be baptized who by baptism being offered to God are received into God's favor. Simple, straightforward. They believed in a baptismal formula that somehow brought people into a relationship with God. It's still with us today. In Rome, it's capital. It's the first sacrament. In fact, you take away baptism from Rome, the entire religion begins to crumble and fall. They have to have baptismal regeneration. If you move forward in history just a little bit and look at uh, some other creeds, let's just take one here. I know that we're time constraints, but if I just take one here. This is the Heidelberg Catechism, question 74. Are infants also to be baptized? Answer, yes. For since they, as well as their parents, belong to the covenant and people of God, and both redemption from sin and the Holy Ghost who works faith are through the blood of Christ promised to them no less than to their parents. They are also by baptism as a sign of the covenant to be engrafted into the Christian church and distinguished from the children of unbelievers. That's straightforward too, isn't it? That baptism somehow performs a miraculous effect in the lives of infants when they're brought to the baptismal font. Well, this document is laced with baptismal sacramental language. And historically, the Lutherans never really broke away from that particular heresy of the Romanist religion. And we have the residue of it yet today. Baptism doesn't save anybody. Baptism doesn't put people into a covenant relationship with God. Baptism doesn't regenerate the soul. It doesn't start the process of justification at all. But yet here it is. And historically we see it in nearly creeds of Lutheranism. Rome makes no bones about it. For them, justification, forgiveness of sin, regeneration, salvation begin at the moment of baptism. It seems to me that conservative Lutherans want it both ways. They seem to hold to a justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone, but fall apart when it comes to the meaning of baptism and the proper recipients of baptism. We can only guess that liberal Lutherans, such as the Lutheran World Federation, seize upon the Lutheran history of baptism and use it as a handy tool to forge a union with Rome. I said 10 years ago that there are two bridges to Rome. There's the high bridge. It's the bridge up here. And that's the bridge that takes you away from sola scriptura. That's the Pentecostal bridge. That's the charismatic bridge. That's the misuse of Holy Spirit and misuse of gifts. That's the high bridge. They're bringing people across to Rome and Rome across to them. But then there's a low bridge that nobody wants to seem to talk about. And that's the acceptance of one another's baptisms. And already throughout England, throughout Scotland, Ireland, some other countries, here in the United States, baptisms are being exchanged. If you're baptized as a Roman Catholic, that's good enough. And Lutherans, not just Lutherans, but listen to me now, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Anglicans, Methodists, are exchanging baptisms with the Roman Catholic religion. There is a low road of baptism going on here that people are crossing. And it's in this document, and it needs to be addressed. A proper understanding of biblical baptism has to be readdressed in the heart of evangelicalism. And nobody can be spared from this. Nobody can be. Nobody can be. We need clear thinking and clear exposition on this critical issue of baptism. And it's laced throughout this document. Finally, and in conclusion, I think we see yet another twist with JDJ. Some Christian scholars have identified a good deal of hypocrisy within the Roman Catholic signers of this statement. The hypocrisy can be seen from one of two sections of JDJ which are unambiguously opposed to the Council of Trent. In other words, 
some people have examined this document and said that Rome has given away her store as well because the statements within, embedded within this document, seem to fly in the face of what's clearly believed by Rome itself. Now, I think that we have to be careful here. Rome is very good at wordsmithing and wordmongering and making words come out the exact way that they want words to come out and concepts to come out the exact way they want concepts to come out. So I don't think that there's a danger here of Rome falling apart internally because they've been inconsistent in signing this document. They will make the document what they want it to say. But yet, I think there is a glaring inconsistency here which can be used insofar as Rome is concerned. The document makes one statement that I could find that I think is flat out contradictory to the Roman Catholic religion. And that statement is this, and I quote, whatever in the justified precedes or follows the free gift of faith is neither the basis of justification nor merits it. Okay? Let me read that again. Whatever in the justified precedes or follows the free gift of faith is neither the basis of justification nor merits it. That's a strong statement. I could have written that. But yet, I think it's contrary to Rome. I think it's contrary to the Council of Trent. Trent says these words, To those who work well unto the end and trust in God, eternal life is to be offered both as a grace mercifully promised to the sons of God and through Christ Jesus and also as a reward promised by God himself to be faithfully given to their good works and merits. 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 But this document says, but whatever in the justified precedes or follows the free gift of faith is neither the basis of justification nor merits it. That's a flat out contradiction. You can't have meritorious justification and non-meritorious justification existing side by side. How is Rome going to get out of this? They're going to get out of it the same way Bob St. Genis got out of it the other night with his insistence that the meritorious works for justification that are a part of Rome's acquittal process are only those works produced by the Spirit of God. Therefore, they are not human works. And that's what they'll do to this document as well. See, Rome believes in meritorious justification but those meritorious works are produced by the Spirit of God. Hence, they are not human works. And that's how they'll get out of it. It's wordsmithing. So, what is the meaning of all of this? What does it amount to? Well, I think in the final analysis, it amounts to nothing. If you're a Christian and you understand Christian theology, it won't amount to much to you. It is hardly earth-shattering when liberal denominations get together with non-Christian religions and forge documents built upon indefinite language in hopes of seducing one another. That's hardly earth-shattering. The real danger comes from the world opinion, and that's where you need to pay attention. The authentic Christian, the one who objects to both the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic religion, will be painted into the corner as an oddball. Genuine Christianity is being escorted off stage in our lifetime. The more mergers between worldwide religions and Rome, the smaller the Christian voice becomes by comparison. We are witnessing in our day and age an unprecedented ecumenical movement which threatens the very existence of Christianity. It will not be long before we are swept off stage into a corner and soon we'll have to be drilling holes to find a way out of the corner and go underground. Because not only will you have to stand up against Roman Catholic religion, you're going to have to stand up against all the major denominations on the evangelical side as well. And they will forge a union, not only with Romanism, but also with the rest of the world's religions. And that's not going to be pretty for true Christians. So, what to do? Well, we trust this too is from the hand of God, who providentially rules all things. And perhaps it is time for the Lord to raise up some more obscure men with hammers and parchments 
in their hands. Perhaps the Lord will raise up some to amble up to castle doors and affix messages which can yet change the world. I hope you do your share. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 